from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. The best of the best. You know, it, it, it's the legacy that we're gonna leave for the next generation. We check in with this year's top producer of the year, what they've learned and the knowledge they're passing on. As farmers in Ukraine work to plant winter wheat, I do think that the new crop Ukraine winter wheat discussion certainly not improving at all. As war rages around them. Don't be scared, she said. The latest from the farm and the front lines as the situation escalates right now on Agri. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. The U.S. Secretary of State calling on every member of the U.N. Security Council to send a clear message to Russia that it must stop its nuclear threats in its war in Ukraine. Anthony Blinken addressed a council session about that conflict. Now it comes after Russian President Vladimir Putin this week announced he was escalating the war effort, threatening to use nuclear weapons if Russian territory is attacked. Now the Russian leader calling up 300,000 reserve troops to supplement his forces, leading to protests in Russia while other Russians appear to be leaving the country. Flight Radar 24 tweeting out this video of the flights departing Moscow and St. Petersburg. Now it's reported that flights have either sold out or are going for extremely high prices with flights from Moscow to Istanbul or Dubai reaching as high as more than $9,000 for a one-way ticket. Russians also rushing to buy train tickets and long lines of cars were spotted heading to Finland. Ag markets watching all of this closely and the impact it could have on food supplies around the world and here at home. Russia is the world's largest wheat exporter, right? And uh, they've got a big crop this year and it's the cheapest crop available. If for some reason you were to escalate in such a manner that Russia's wheat exports or wheat exports out of the Black Sea were at risk, that would be tremendously friendly. So the, um, the wheat market has some renewed fears, tensions here, whatever you want to call it, probably some new speculative money making its way into the market. And I don't know, I don't know exactly what the fear or the thought is. We've already discounted a lot of what's going on in Ukraine, but it's just additional fears, I think, regarding not only the Black Sea, but just the global food situation in general, given that Russia is such a big player. Amid all of this, intense fighting continues on the ground in Ukraine. Nick Patton Walsh talked with people just trying to survive life day to day in the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, a city that's been under siege for three months. Bakhmut is a mess. Russia edging towards it, but not inside. Prepared for street to street fighting, and meanwhile torn to pieces. The losses are heavy in exposed positions around the city particularly here. Russia's invasion tearing through the green treasured land it claims to covet. Why do they want Bakhmut so much? They retreated elsewhere and they need a victory, something significant, he says, so they throw forces here. Of course we have casualties, not today in our unit, but you can't avoid dead or wounded, sometimes heavily injured. I lost my close friend five days after we came here. A few roads away, Andrei is cycling home. His eyes tell you how life is here. First the shooting, but there's no electricity or water. It's not too bad. Only every second house is ruined. There are still many people here, buying a lot of Natalia's potatoes. We sold half a ton today, she says. Who knows if the shelling is coming or going. Don't be scared, she said. <laughs> 24 hours later, and Ukrainian artillery is hitting positions on the city's edge amid reports Russia has got closer. Much fresh smoke, and it's always hard to know what Moscow thought it was hitting. Walking home with a squeaky wheel and food is Maria. Back to her son. Silence and terror, in turn, enveloping the city. Nick Payton Walsh, CNN, Bakhmut, Ukraine. Meanwhile, farmers continue to work in Ukraine. The latest numbers from the country's 
Agricultural ministries show 9% of the country's wheat crop is in the ground. Ministry telling Reuters it expects to plant fewer acres in the next season, 30% fewer. And without help, that number's been projected as high as 60%. Now the reduction in grain acreage is due in large part to the higher cost for seeds, fertilizer, and fuel. This week, Ukraine's Ag Ministry estimating that winter wheat planting could drop from about 11.3 million acres this year to 9.3 million acres next year. And USDA's Foreign Ag Service is projecting wheat harvest next season to be a little more than half what it was last year. As it stands right now, uh, the trade has revived its, its viewpoints, maybe from a 20% cut in, uh, in wheat plantings. Maybe now it's going to be 40, uh, as of uh, yesterday's discussion, maybe 42, 43% below prior year numbers. So I do think that the new crop Ukraine winter wheat discussion certainly not improving at all. Now, as we reported last week, a new report from the Conflict Observatory shows roughly 14% of Ukrainian crop storage facilities have been destroyed, damaged, or are controlled by Russia and its forces. Recovery efforts are now underway in the Turks and Caicos Islands. That's after Hurricane Fiona moved through the region. Authorities were thankful no lives were lost on the islands during the hurricane. The storm is expected to pass west of Bermuda this morning. Meteorologist Matt Urasavik joining us now. And Matt, that's not the only disturbance you're tracking right now in the tropics. There's another that you're keeping an eye on that could track to the Gulf Coast. That's right, Clinton. The tropics becoming very active out there and our next system kind of to keep an eye on here is going to be one that is in parts of the Caribbean right now could be moving towards the Yucatan Peninsula, but eventually could end up making a hard right turn up into the Gulf of Mexico right now. It does look like it's about 90% chance of development over the next four to five days, and it is looking likely that that could be possible. So something that we need to keep an eye on here, anywhere from extreme eastern parts of Texas all the way through the entire Gulf Coast of Florida needs to be on guard next week for a potential tropical system to be moving our way. And here's a look at that system on our future track model, tracking through the Caribbean, eventually coming up towards Cuba and then making a turn up into the Gulf. We got to keep an eye on this, especially not only with the hurricane potential, but also with the heavy rain potential that is going to be likely as we head really over the next week. A lot of that could be all along the Gulf Coast, and that's something that will continue to track right here on Ag Day. And harvest time can bring out the sillies in some people. Emma of Ag with Emma across Several social media channels sharing this picture and Emma saying this is her first full day of corn harvest and this is the selfie that she took and she asked, am I doing it right? And you sure are, Emma. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Where the market's trading the latest Black Sea news, Michelle Rook has the latest coming up next. And later we're off to Minnesota to spend a day with the 2022 top producer of the year and how they're putting those prizes to work in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by Enzone from Farm Shop MFG, which allows you to rehydrate your soybeans from 10 to 13%. On a 20,000 bushel bin, that's an extra semi-load added to your bottom line. Order your Enzone fan now and get 13% off while supplies last. Livestock were under pressure Thursday with the grains mixed. Michelle Rook joins us to recap the session. Joining us with market analysis is Sean Hackett with Hackett Financial Advisors. Well, as we looked at the grains on Thursday, we did see corn and wheat up, and it looked like we were kind of continuing to put a little bit of war premium in. We certainly were. Yeah, at some point, though, you, know, you can only trade it for so long, and then something has to happen to confirm that that's a real issue or not. And I think the market is starting to labor now that we put enough premium in. Where's the big moment that Putin's going to show what he's really going to do? And we just haven't seen it yet. So for it. the time being, you think we have enough war premium put into those markets? Without knowing for sure he's going to do it? Yes, I do. I think we put in as much as I think you can put in without actually having verification of something more. Yes. Now, soybeans went the opposite direction, of course. Oh, we had lower soybean meals, so was that the big story, or was it just because we had kind of poor exports, or was it profit taking, or what? We have some really good rainfall in Brazil all of a sudden. You know, we're getting some really good rainfall. They're getting ready to rock and roll and plant 
this record crop supposedly that everyone is expecting from them. And, you know, we've been gun shy with soybeans in Brazil because of some very poor crops the last few years. So I think getting off to a really good start, you know, maybe that 155 million metric ton crop people are talking about, people start to think, well, maybe, maybe it's possible to get up to a good start. So I think that had a lot to do with it. Well, that's certainly going to be a headwind. But the rest of the complex really felt like we were still trading the Fed news, the economic concerns, even the livestock felt like that. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we've been watching the Federal Reserve chairmen for a long, long time. And I don't ever recall in, in, in my adult life seeing a Fed chairman this strong about his conviction and not actually caring about the economic consequences. I mean, it's it's just which is not used to seeing this. And I think everyone's coming to realization you know, that the pivot that we've been so accustomed to over the years, you know, that may, we, we may be drawn from a different playbook, the Volcker playbook, as people call it. And, um, and if that's the case, demand for meat and livestock and that sort of thing is going to be under pressure. Unfortunately, that might mean more pain ahead. Thanks for joining us, Sean Hackett with Hackett Financial Advisors. More Ag Day coming up. Just Matt Yurisavik joining us here, starting with the Root Zone Moisture Map. And Matt, as you look at this, it's kind of that area we've been talking about, the Southern Plains, Kansas, Nebraska, is still very dry. Yeah, extremely dry. Got a little bit of shower activity uh, over the last couple of days, but now we'll go into another dry pattern as we'll still be watching uh, for more rain, Northern Plains especially, for next week. And taking a look at our root zone moisture map, you can see extremely dry conditions still, especially in western Nebraska, parts of Colorado, and down through the southern plains, Oklahoma and Kansas. Still extremely dry, still dealing with some moisture here across the Mississippi River Valley and some back in northern California, but most of the U.S. staying extremely dry. Florida still very, very uh, moist, lots of moisture down that way, and they could be getting more as we head through the upcoming week. But here's a look at that uh, latest uh, drought monitor, and actually you can see still right along with uh, that root zone, extremely dry through the middle part of the country, back through Utah, Nevada, and uh, California as well. Haven't seen many improvements to this. Haven't also uh, seen a ton of rain out of any uh, system over the last week. So something we'll continue to keep an eye on, but in the deep south, South starting to improve a little bit every time we see kind of that update. Here's a look at that moisture coming along with that cold front sliding down to the south. Not a whole lot going on though, just some scattered showers and storms along that front and another system that will get going here over the next few days and into the weekend there across the northern plains. Other than that, most of the southern half of the country will be dry, but that will change heading into next week as well. This is the one system we've got moving a warm front up into the northern plains and the Great Lakes. High pressure out ahead of it keeps things dry and then the cold front across Florida may keep things unsettled as well. High pressure will take over in the west though and that's going to keep things very bright and warm back in the west. Meanwhile, some cooler air filtering into the Great Lakes, the northeast, keeping things mild, more fall like as we step into the official start of the fall season. And then we've got some more scattered shower activity that's going to be going on across the upper Midwest, Great Lakes and into the northeast heading through the weekend. Still going to be cooler up in uh, most of that area right in there. Kind of a break from the heat, the humidity, but it's still going on across the south. And you can really see where that heat is, where those temperatures still stay in the 60s and even 70s down across the south. But even by tomorrow afternoon, still dealing with the heat in the center of the country, along the Gulf Coast and in the southwest, while we're still dealing with cooler conditions across the northeast and the Great Lakes. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. Huntsville, Alabama, sunny and mild, a high of 79 degrees. Heading to Waterloo, Iowa, showers likely, a high of 59. And in Fresno, California, it's going to be sunny and warm, a high of 88 degrees. Ag Day is brought to you by MetLife Investment Management's Agricultural Finance Group. MetLife Investment Management is positioned to help you grow your business with a competitive farm, ranch, and agribusiness loan. To learn more, visit investments.metlife.com backslash agriculture. The 
U.S. hay supply is at a 50-year low. Drover says when you couple that with rising costs, now is the time to plan purchases of hay supplies. Now take a look at this table. In many places, hay production has been reported to be 50% of average or less. That includes Nebraska. And then there are the prices. You can see here the blue line with prices right now going for above $240 per ton. Now check out this story over at drovers.com for links to help check on the latest prices. And the University of Idaho is one step closer to building the nation's largest research dairy and experimental farm. State officials approved the university's plan to use $23 million to buy roughly 640 acres of farmland in South Central Idaho. That's in the heart of the state's dairy industry. The 2,000 cow research dairy could help the state's dairy industry find solutions for gas emissions, land and water pollution, and waste systems. Leaders say the project could be millions of dollars in research grants for the school. Being the best in the business doesn't mean you stop focusing on improvement. We're off to this year's top producer to see how they're working to step up their game, even after winning top prize. Closed captioning on Ag Day is brought to you by BASF. BASF, helping you do the biggest jobs on earth. As our agricultural producers race toward harvest, there's an award they may want to consider applying for. Top producer of the year. Ag Day's Michelle Rook recently caught up with this year's winner, the Malikas of Villard, Minnesota, who are enjoying the title and the prize perks that come with it. It was humbling, but it was actually unbelievable. I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even think I was uh, worthy or capable of winning it. That's how Villard, Minnesota farmer Todd Mullica describes how he and his family felt after being named the 2022 top producer. Mullica Enterprises is a 1,200 cow dairy where they raise 1,000 replacement heifers and farm more than 2,500 acres. They maximize profitability and still preserve the land through good soil health principles, including a diversity of rotations. All with the rotation, you know, uh, from the dairy and the different crops the dairy cattle need, you know, we grow them all and it keeps a good rotation along with uh, good fertility back into the soil. They also use manure from the dairy to decrease the need for commercial fertilizer products. You know, the soil health is key. So we buy very little commercial fertilizer. The pretty much the only commercial fertilizer we buy is nitrogen. So our soils are all very healthy with our N, P, and K. However, Todd says they can always improve and are fully utilizing the agronomic consulting with Continuum Ag they received through the Top Producer Award program. See all those little, like all that fungal community stuff right yeah. there? Right. Hora is helping the Malikas integrate all the principles of soil health into their farm. We're trying to get the outcome of healthier soil, more resilient soil, and we got to do that by minimizing disturbance, chemical and physical, keep armor on the soil, keep a living root as much as we can, get as much diversity into the system as possible, maybe integrate livestock back out onto the land, and most importantly, do this all in the context of your farm. Hora is also helping them discover how offensive moves like no-till and cover crops can help build the microbial community in their soil and the advantages of having those microorganisms working for them. And that's why on our farm we've been able to decrease our inputs as much as we have and put those dollars right back to our bottom line. The Malikas also appreciate the use of the Case IH 620 quad track and they've definitely put it to good use. Operating it with the tillage unit uh, we talked about putting a blade on it and using it for pushing pushing feed, silage, haylid. It's got the multifunction joystick, shuttle shift, uh, hydraulic controls on uh, at the tip of your fingers. It's, it's, it's really nice. It's a nice machine. Todd says they're still a bit in shock about being named a top producer and they aren't resting on their laurels. They continue to build for the future with five of their seven children actively engaged in the operation. You know, it, it, it's the legacy that we're going to leave for the next generation. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Now, if you're interested in applying for the Top Producer of the Year or any of the other associated awards, the Young Farmer Horizon Award or the Executive Women in Agriculture Trailblazer Award, you can head over to tpsummit.com. There you can download the applications. Now, the deadline for all three awards is coming up. 
It's next Friday, September 30th. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Day and Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.